This story is about working hard even when it seems silly. It's not boring. And for the people trying to make crazy things happen. It's that shot of optimism, yeah, yeah. It's not boring. Not boring is for the optimists. Take a little shot of optimism. Take a little shot of optimism. Let's just zoom out and take a little shot of optimism. Happy Thursday and welcome to Not Boring Founders. I'm your host, Packy McCormick, and Not Boring Founders is a podcast where we talk to the people building the future. Today, I have Ryan Glasgow, the CEO and founder of Sprig. You might have read about Sprig when I wrote about them a couple of years ago, and a lot's changed since. Sprig is currently the easiest way to collect product feedback, inform product decisions, and increase the company's speed to innovation. You might also be familiar with Sprig because at the bottom of the weekly dose of optimism, we include a little survey. Did you enjoy it? Did you think it was meh? Or did you think it was downright bad? Early on when we were doing the weekly dose of optimism, we were actually wondering whether we should continue doing it, whether sending people an email a couple of times a week was too much and whether people even like the new format. And we just threw the Sprig survey down there at the bottom to get results and see what people thought. I think it came back something like 86% of people said that they loved the, the weekly dose of optimism. So we kept writing it and now we're something like 30 weeks into that. So Sprig saved optimism. But today's a really interesting one because you know, lots changed since I wrote about Sprig. The company has evolved. They raised money at the perfect time, and they're leaning into uh, building and growing in this downturn. And Ryan is an experienced product leader and now CEO who has a lot of thoughts on the current market and where the world is heading. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ryan Glasgow, the CEO and founder of Sprig. Ryan, welcome to Not Boring Founders. Thanks for having me, Packy. It's good to, to connect here after I think about two years now since you first wrote about us and find out to be on the podcast. Yeah. A lot has changed in the world, in the company since we first worked together. And thank you for being a longtime sponsor of Not Boring in a Bunch of Ways. But since we first worked together, there's a whole new name on the company. You've raised a bunch of money from great investors. You've launched new products. What was the company when it started and where are you now? It definitely started just based on my background is in product management and wanting to get quicker insights and hear from customers in a more rapid way. And I was sitting there and bought the domain userleap.com for 12 bucks, very humble beginnings and got that .com. And we just started to grow and it certainly exceeded uh, initial expectations where we're at today and started to outgrow the name. And so we ended up switching the name from userleap.com to sprig.com. So we went through a rebrand since you and I last chatted and changed our name along the way and also expanded our product portfolio as well. And it's just really, both have just been key milestones for our growth as we march further and further forward. There has to be some special connection to the domain that you bought for $12 and that you started this whole thing on all the growth started out. Like, what was that process like? Maybe a little bit tactically, but even just emotionally, like, how do you think about changing the name of your baby? The marketing team came to me and we were actually starting to get pull from companies that didn't use the word user. And so we were talking about companies like Anheuser-Busch and you're talking to companies like Condé Nast, they have their own nomenclature. Is it a prospect? Is it a customer? Is it someone who drinks beer? And so we started to really look at where we wanted to go with a company and didn't want a name that was really limiting. And when I looked at some of the iconic names like Figma, Figma is a Japanese toy and Slack, there's no meaning, even though I know Stuart Butterfield likes to create meaning for Slack and other companies like Plaid as well. We just wanted a, a word that we could really brand and turn into our own. And so the marketing team came to me, you know, Katie, and pitched me on, let's think about something different. And so we actually went to Lexicon, who's the number one naming agency in the world. They had done Pen Pentium. PowerBook, cool. Swiffer, Portal, Sonos, so many iconic names Legends. and got to work directly with the founder of the firm. And he works with Steve Jobs and a lot of the early product names at Apple. And so it was a really exciting experience to work with him and craft names for us and work with him on finding that right name and getting that domain name and getting the trademarks around the world. It's really an exhaustive process, but it really sets us up for our ambitions and where I want to take Sprig which is a great transition into where do you want to take Sprig? What 
it was the first product. I love a description there. Then you've added on recently. And then where do you want to take Sprig in the future? You've given yourself this vessel that you can add a lot of things onto now that's not as specific as user leap. So what's the plan? Last time we chatted, we were yeah very focused on in-product surveys. And it was really just a great insertion for us into the broader market of teams learning from their customers, learning from their users, learning from the beer drinkers <laughs> and whatever our customers call their end users and customers. And what we see though, is just a huge emerging field of companies that want to really learn and connect and co-create with their customers. Mm -hmm. And when you look at all the innovation that's happened on the building uh, with tools like Figma and AWS and React and continuous development, continuous deployment with GitHub, so much innovation is happening there, but it really feels like we're just scratching the surface and just getting started on the other side of that. And so teams just have incredible, mature, cutting edge tools to build amazing product experiences, but the ability to think about what should that product experience be and what features should we include and what design should we go with and all those little decisions along the way, that's really that emerging field that we're tackling here at Sprig where we see just a new emerging market of tools Spring included to help those teams really deeply understand their customers and build those 10 out of 10 experiences. And so the in-product surveys was that first launch, but we also launched concept testing as well. And that really allows teams before they even write a line of code to take their Figma designs or Adobe XD mockups and put those in front of customers, hear from customers, record video clips of customers and de-risk those decisions and make those decisions before they even start building. And so we're going forward, going to continue to innovate and push the boundaries on helping teams create those 10 out of 10 experiences in this emerging field of really building better experiences and making those decisions with your customers. A question that I see, I think debated a bunch about on Twitter is like how much great products just comes from a great product mind versus kind of testing and talking to customers. You've worked with a lot of great product and user research teams. Where do you think the right balance is, or does it matter product by product and differ product by product? What have you learned? Yeah, we, and we certainly see this debate as well from teams. And I think a lot of people realize that every great 10 out of 10 product experience that we've used, those teams deeply care about the customers. And so everyone has their own way of approaching that. Steve Jobs actually was known for hiding in the bushes at the Palo Alto Apple store, and he would overhear shoppers talk about the Apple products in the field and listen on their way out, what they bought, saw them, what they're buying, what they're not buying, and really hear them talk to the people that they were with. And so that was his way of actually conducting customer research. It was secretly watching and observing people, which is the best possible experience of people in Apple retail stores. And, I, I've and, heard a lot of Steve Jobs stories. I've not heard that one. That's really cool. Yes. Yeah. If you Google it, you'll see he was very, maybe lesser known, but he was very focused on customer research. It was just in a very unique cutting edge way that most people, he was not interested in panels. So people assume that he didn't do customer research, but he actually did. He just was innovating in a more realistic way of understanding customers. And when we think about the 10 out of 10 experiences that we use today, you think around Loom, or it might be Robinhood, or Netflix, or Dropbox, or Notion, they're all Sprig customers, and they all use Sprig. And so the companies that are building the 10 out of 10 experiences today are the ones that realize that the ability to build a great product experience, the tools, and the AI, and the code, and how we put these products together, it is maturing. There's less advantages. We're all on very similar tech stacks. But the ability to understand what customers want is where the innovation is happening. And that's where we're really excited to partner with the companies that are currently building 10 out of 10 experiences and utilizing Sprig today. And so probably any of the 10 out of 10 experiences that you can think of, probably 80% of them are using Sprig. And at a minimum, there's co strong correlation because they realize that that's the battlefield. That's how they're going to become the category leader. And that's how they're going to stay as the category leader by innovating on how they're deeply understanding customer needs. I think the Steve Jobs example is a really interesting one because this is 
not an ad, but having used the Sprig product a lot and putting putting the kind of surveys, the micro surveys at the bottom of my newsletters, there is this really good balance between you get the raw feed that you would get from a normal survey, but you get it organized in a way. What comes to mind is this example of wrote about a company called Hadrian that's doing kind of like precision manufacturing using a combination of software and people. And there were these attempts before them that were like fully automated and then it just never worked. And so actually you need humans and you need that like hands-on piece for a bunch of that. And so I, I don't know, that's the first thing that comes to mind when I look at my spring survey results, because it's like the AI is clearly understanding what's going on here and organizing things in a way that's consumable for me and gives me the high level kind of understanding, but it doesn't feel like I'm too far abstracted from just like that raw data. You strike a really nice balance there. So the Steve Jobs example, I think it is right. Like you see the teams that you work with, like obviously it's convenient if you're getting thousands and thousands of responses to things, unlike I am, you need some way to organize. Can you tell from your product statistics and usage, whether they're like diving into each one of the comments or if they're just looking at the high level, like how are they using the surveys? A few different ways. Say one of the big innovations that we're seeing that we're actually learning from our customers is called critical user journeys. And what they're doing is they're moving beyond NPS which is maybe a, a, top line, a top line revenue analogous metric and you get a single score, but companies now want the full balance sheet. They want to know line by line how their user experience is performing. And what they're doing is they're running continuous in-product microsurveys across all of their critical user journeys. And it could be their checkout experience or the trade experience or the deposit experience, or maybe that login or signup experience at the end of those flows. So it's not disruptive, it's at the very end and it's rotating through, Spring is automatically rotating through all those users. So one person might receive C, one Sprig survey in three or even six months. But what they're able to do is actually roll up in a weighted basis, all of those scores and all those open-ended pieces of responses into a single score. And they're able to pipe that into their Looker dashboards and their business intelligence tools right alongside that revenue data or the customer success data or the analytics data. And when they see that score drop, they can drill down and say, hey, this specific part of our user experience took a dip, or maybe it really increased. And they're able to get that full balance sheet of their user experience. What we're also seeing, which I think you know what you mentioned as well, is the AI. We're seeing a lot of these companies collect hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. We had one customer collect over 100,000 open-ended responses to a single study in just three days. And so it's incredibly powerful, the ability to connect with the customers in have all that data collected with Sprig, but more importantly, which you know, you're mentioning is the AI helps you really group it all together. And so these teams can see the themes and see at a high level, but they can drill down exactly into the 30 or 50 or hundred responses in that theme. And that's where you get the raw emotion. You've probably seen that in your newsletter. Yeah. Oh, you know, I have. <laughs> Someone writes in a really raw response and they love it. You mentioned you continued with the newsletter because of the, just a really strong positive feedback that you were getting. And that was probably a very emotional response that you had by people saying they, they love that newsletter. And so it's been really energizing for us uh, to see our customers really react emotionally and very strongly to the good, but also the areas to improve their product experiences. And AI has been a big lift for that. Yeah, it's been fascinating, right? Because like you'll read one comment that like that is maybe negative and it hurts and whatever, but then you can take a step back and like look at the groupings and there's maybe the one category of negative and a bunch of positive and the numbers are good. And so it does help balance like just the sting that you get from reading bad feedback, particularly in my case when it's a product is myself. But yeah, that that balance is I think really good. And the AI piece, like obviously now everyone's used to using chat GPT and Dolly and whatever else. What I really liked was how like AI products before seemed a little bit dumb. And if they were grouping things, it was because there was like the same word in a bunch of different answers. And I thought that Sprigs organized it the way that I would have organized the things had I had a lot of time and were I good at organizing. How did you guys invest in, in that side of the business? What did you do to build up those capabilities? Yeah. And that was definitely very important because when I was at Weebly, I saw these incredibly talented PhD user researchers spending days and weeks per month manually 
organizing in spreadsheets, open-ended responses. And it was for a single survey that might have 10 questions. You could get a thousand responses or 300 responses. It ends up being thousands, tens of thousands of responses to manually organize. And so what I did, was I actually watched researchers and what we were able to do with their use AI to actually recreate the exact techniques and motions that they were using. And we, the first person that joined Sprig right after me was a PhD data scientist with a background in AI. So we actually started building the AI before we started building the product. Huh. That's how important the AI has been here at Sprig. And we, we use expert user researchers in a human loop process to review every single response. And so very similar to Cruise driving around San Francisco with people at the wheel, ears at the wheel, it's tagging all the data, it's learning as it's going. We've now had over 10 million responses reviewed by expert user researchers full-time who are full-time at Sprig. And it's built up this really great set of training data. And that's really the moat around AI. It's not the models anymore. You know, it's the data. And so we're building this really great corpus of training data that we're now switching out new models and upgrading our models all the time. But that training data is really what's feeding the models and helping power the models to give you those insights that you're looking for. I guess just generally on this, because every founder in the world with a software product is going to try to put AI in whether it makes sense or not into their products right now. Like when you're thinking about just designing a product that has a great user experience that also might leverage AI in some spot, like what tips would you give people and what would you say to avoid when everyone's trying to jam AI into their project, or their products now? It definitely is starting to feel a little bit forced in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it is very similar to just building any other feature as a product person. Of what is the jobs to be done? What is the person to accomplish? Can AI help facilitate, help accelerate? But we do see a lot of trust issues with AI. And you're seeing that now play out very publicly with chat GPT. Yeah. It gives out a lot of very incorrect answers with 100% confidence. And the AI experiences that you had around matching word phrases based on string matching and one says price, there says price. Let's assume that they go together there has been a lot of trust issues with AI. And so people are, for building with AI, I think a lot of it is how do you build that trust with the users? I think people are still warming up and we have the innovators that are playing around with AI, but I think the practical business applications, it is still an area where even the sales side are having to really work with prospects and really prove out the capabilities because it's not something that they just will take and believe if you tell them. They really need to see how it works with their own data to build that trust and show this is actually something that can take on mission critical business applications. Makes a lot of sense. Switching gears a little bit. The first time we talked, we were in the middle of the greatest bull market of all time. Software companies were spending money on other software companies' software. Now, obviously, the market is different than it was before. And you do have a lot of kind of software company clients, although you mentioned that you have more, more traditional companies as well. But what has the past year been like? Luckily, you raised money at a really good time. You've chosen to double down recently, and I like leaning in a market like this. But what's that experience been like as, as the CEO here? As someone who's always been in startups, 17, 16, 17 in the startup world, definitely have seen this as the most challenging two years to build and grow a company. I think just the volatility in the market, both the stimulus COVID volatility, but also now we're technically in a recessionary environment on the other end of that yeah, has made it challenging to just navigate the waters and the fundraising that founders were raising great rounds and really high valuations, but now they're taking a lot of flack for the high valuations, the other end of it. Yeah. And then everyone went remote and now a lot of companies are going to hybrid or I know a lot of startups now are just doing five days in the office, just the startups that are starting from scratch. And so even the culture and expectations around the office environment is fairly volatile, what's possible, what's normal, what expectations are. And so, yeah, I guess at a high level, it has been certainly a lot to navigate, but I think that founders are always prepared for uncertainty. And that's one thing that you always face as a founder is an uncertain future. Yeah. And certainly just lean into that even more and said, Hey, there's less certainty. There's more uncertainty going forward, but we're going to focus on agility. And one of our values is to quickly iterate 
And so I really reminded the team, like we're going to have to lean into this value more than ever as we navigate the world that we're in. It's always a good value to have. And you had it before this market, but it seems like a particularly good one right now. Have you seen less competition like as others that, that might've seen your valuation and seen your success when it was easy to raise money could have come after and now they're not agile enough. They weren't actually good enough product. Have you seen competition drop away? Are there benefits to this as well? Yeah, we do have competition. We have some emerging competition as well. I do think that this year, potentially next year, we're going to see like a smaller field. We're in the fortunate position of many years of runway. And so can outlast even the deepest recession. But we, I do know that a lot of the companies that are emerging into this field don't have that runway. And we have had a lot of companies actually approach us and say, hey, can you buy us? Here's what we've got. You want the IP, you want the team, you want the tech, you want the customers, you want the product, wholesale. What do you want to buy? And so I think we'll see more of that in 2023, given the runways that are starting to run out from the 2021 year. This is a fascinating one that we weren't planning to talk about, but we are going to see a lot more of at least companies approaching and trying to be acquired by the companies that have stronger balance sheets. As a CEO of a company with a stronger balance sheet, how do you evaluate that? Are you taking any of it seriously? Are you trying to just focus on building the organic company? What are the considerations in your mind when someone comes to you? Yeah. And we had a CEO show up at our office unannounced. Hey, looking to get bought. So we've seen all the different scenarios now. I think that with the extreme efficiency that any investor is looking for and just the prudent way to run a business, and this is not a new thing, it's just, just pre-COVID, this is how it always was. <laughs> a lot of people are realizing this is just returning to normal. It is difficult to fit in even an aqua hire, yeah. candidly, to fit in even a tech acquisition or a customer acquisition because the multiples that a lot of people are expecting, you just don't make economic sense. And so we looked at a lot of opportunities, but it's just tough to look at if we build this ourselves, if we can acquire customers for this amount, if this, can we hire this team through our recruiting team, you know, equivalent with our own recruiting team, if no one else buys them, you know, we pass an opportunity and the team came to us, said, Hey, no one's going to buy us. Will you hire us? So you also get those opportunities as well. And we, so that's why we've passed because it's just difficult to make it work with the growing unemployment with the extreme efficiency goals that we have to make the numbers work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I would imagine it'd be tempting in some cases to, to look at things like that, but it seems like instead, we talked about before, you've now doubled down on the product, launched the prototyping product. What was that decision? Is that a, was that always on the roadmap? Was that kind of like, all right, we're, now's our moment. We are well capitalized and others aren't gonna be able to invest. So let's do it. Like, how do you think about doing that in the middle of this recessionary period? Definitely saw with the mid-market SMB categories, they are looking for, they're looking for a suite of products. You think about HubSpot or Intercom uh, or some of these more SMB focused, mid-market focused companies, Notion, very versatile tool. I do think particularly with the economy, we're going to shift from a unbundling, which I think in a bull market, you have an unbundled and companies will buy 10 SaaS vendors and hope they work together and they'll pay two or three times what it might cost to get that in a consolidated solution. But I do think now that we're looking at returning to a normal environment of going back to really lean, efficient growth, I do think there's going to be a bundling of SaaS and companies are going to be looking for three to four different products in a single vendor. And so for us really thinking about where the world is going and right now everyone's looking at their vendor list and deciding which ones to cut. So you're either pushing someone else out or you're getting pushed out. And so I just kind of think about this internally and how it's going with our customers. And so we want to be pushing out other vendors. And so that's really what prompted us to think about concept testing, knowing that was a common purchase for our customers. Let's push out these other vendors and let's actually be that tool that can bundle multiple products into one. As you think about bundling multiple products, you can see as, and I'm not a product person at all, but that there's going to be a very an interesting opportunity to say, this is what our potential users told us in concept testing. And then here's what they told us when they were actually using the real product. Do those things match? How do you think about the connectivity between the different pieces of the stool that you add to the suite over time? And that was from the customer perspective. 
Yeah, that was, the previous answer was just for my entrepreneur, yeah. like economic scenario response. But thinking about from our customer perspective, they're absolutely asking, we use Sprig post-launch. We would love for Sprig to be our partner pre-launch as well. And Sprig to be our partner for bringing new products to market from not only launch, but also from idea. And so when we think about that single partner, that bundled solution that can go from, I have an idea, we're gonna put together some wireframes, some mockups in Figma, we're gonna share it with some customers, we're gonna put together a clickable prototype in Figma or Adobe XD. We're gonna put that in front of more customers. And then we're gonna roll this out in a beta with 10% of our customers. They did want us to be able to be that partner and look at those insights in one place but also follow those users and say, hey, this user gave us the feedback at version one, version two, version three, and here's how we're improving and here's what they're saying. And so from our customer perspective, that was absolutely the, the, the feedback that we were getting using Sprig, which is very meta, but they were telling us they wanted that single vendor from idea to post launch and see that visitor data together and look at that. Let's look at Packy's profile, visitor profile. We've got the events for you, the attributes for you. We've got all the survey responses from your concept tests and from your survey in product survey data and look at that full visitor timeline of the holistic view of that individual and their experience with not only the mockups, but also with the live product experiences. I have a question is you've talked about 10 out of 10 experiences. It feels like if you compare a decade ago to now, just the software experience that you're used to and that you just expect as an average user is just at a whole completely other level. And that is just the highest bar is where regular expectations are set. How do people raise the bar now? What does a 10 out of 10 expect experience look like in five or 10 years? We're certainly seeing expectations increase every year and talking about the ability to build products, it has become somewhat commoditized in terms of the tech stack and the technologies, but the ability to build the world-class experiences is the frontier that I think every, where the battle is being fought right now. And the 10 out of 10 experiences, there's a great book called Don't Make Me Think uh, on user experience. And I think that is really the ultimate question uh, and prompt for building a 10 out of 10 experience is as a customer or a user, does the product make you think? And when you look at the marketing website, the signup flow, the onboarding experience, you invite the teammate, you come back, what's the cognitive overload? And if you have a basically zero cognitive overload, that I would put as a 10 out of 10 experience. As that cognitive load increases, that's really gonna bring that down to a five out of 10 or a three out of 10 experience. And we look at the category leaders, whether it's music or travel or stock trading, you are seeing that the experience, the 10 out of 10 experiences are most likely the ones that are winning their categories. You think around Netflix and the media right, as well. And so I think for teams right now, there is a lot of friction in their products. Their customers and users do have to think there is a high cognitive overload. And I know there's a common kind of paradigm about startups where, you know, six out of 10 startup websites, you ask someone, what does a startup do? And they can't tell you that's making someone yeah. think. And so it's as people building products and bringing products to market, how can we really reduce that cognitive overload as much as possible? And the only way to do that is like with Steve jobs, really in context in that Apple store, listening and learning and hearing from people what the cognitive overload is for considering those Apple products in the field. And our goal at Sprig is to actually recreate that experience with in-context understanding as someone's reading your newsletter, they just get to the bottom, they can tell you what they think, what was working, what was not working. And our goal is to help the people building the products get into the minds of the people using the products to bring that cognitive overload down as much as possible. So ultimately those end customers don't have to think, and there's that zero cognitive overload to build that 10 out of 10 experience. And so I think for teams today to win in your category, to maintain that category advantage, it's really making sure there's zero cognitive overload. We are playing a small part in helping companies get there, 
There's other tools as well, but I think the more that companies can lean into the new cutting edge technologies around deeply understanding customer needs are ultimately going to be the ones that win. Since you work with kind of most of the kind of top companies by product experience, I won't name any names, but it does feel like a lot of the maybe more mature, excellent software just gets more and more bloated as maybe business goals take over from like listening to customers or just creating that really simple, don't have to think user experience is, I guess you see this more than I do. Is that a vector of attack for startups that like the goals of the big company are just different? And so they're open to someone who listens to customers more, or is there something else going on when you see these trade-offs and these products that I used to love that I'm like, ah, man, like that just doesn't feel like it was made with like my best interests in mind here. Yeah. We are seeing some of the legacy software really just deal with the ability of becoming these very large ocean freight carriers and very difficult to move. And a lot, one company came to us, it's probably over, I think hundred billion in market cap, a software company and said, our tech is so legacy. It's going to take us three years to rewrite everything that we're doing into a modern tech stack. We want Sprig to be our partner and they're now a customer, but they're dealing with a three-year rewrite and there's at least 10,000 software engineers are going to have to go through this rewrite with them. And so when you think about their inability to actually build a 10 out of 10 experience. It's not that they might not know what they need to do, but it's their ability to actually act on what they want to do. And I think that's the opening for startups today. I think one 10 out of 10 experience I'll say is linear. Yeah. I think a lot of people think of linear as a 10 out of 10 experience. And I think at last seen and Jira has made a lot of great moves, but they are dealing to an extent with a very legacy, difficult tech stack that they're starting to update. We saw a lot of updates five or seven years ago. That's an example where it is leaving that opening for a company like Lanier to come in with that 10 out of 10 experience because of the inability for some of these larger incumbents to take action. My friend, Ben, I was a CEO composer, is going to hear this and laugh at me because he texted me the other day and he's like, I told you two years ago that Lanier was the company that I'd put the most money on and now look at them. So he's going to be very happy to hear that you said that. The closing question here is what the world looks like in a decade if you're wildly successful. So our purpose is to make experiences that matter. And our mission is to be the leading research platform for digital companies. And if we do get that number one spot and we do get that market penetration that we're on track to do, but also have a long road ahead of us and just getting started, we do want every digital product experience that anyone interacts with, whether it's the screen on the airplane or the screen in your car or the digital kiosk for banking, when you're using an ATM to your phones and the mobile applications to the desktop experiences that you're using, how can we remove all that friction, make those end users not think about any of the actions of where they want to go from point A to point B, which is really why products exist to take us from a point A to point B. And so, you know, if we are able to accomplish our goals, uh, it is really bringing those five out of 10 or six out of 10, or I won't name them, the seven out of 10 experiences that we all use that get us to point A to point B, but ultimately do make us think, and we do get stuck and we do have questions and they're difficult or cumbersome and really remove all that friction. And what we see is that if that's possible, those companies are able to have a much wider reach by removing the cognitive overload because more people can use those products. And those companies will ultimately make experiences that matter because of the reach that they're having in the world, because of they're now the category leaders, because they've grown so much faster by building that more frictionless, more seamless experience that is accessible for more end users. I love it. As a user of some good software and some bad software, I am rooting for you to make that happen. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on Boring Founders and for your partnership over the years. It's been fun to watch you grow. Awesome. Thank you, Packy. Excited to catch up again, I'm sure, in another two years and share another update. And really excited to be a part of just giving you a little bit of feedback every week on the work that you're doing and using Sprig to get there. Amen. That's a date.